Okay, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name, as Chris said, is Kirsten Sobana. I'm, I'm affiliated with STRIVE through the International Center for Research on Women, one of its partners. Um, just to give you a little bit of a, a very brief introduction on, on STRIVE, and then I'd like to present our, um, introduce our presenter today. Um, STRIVE is a, is a DFID-funded research partner consortium with six partners headed by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, other partners include the Witzwaterstrand Reproductive Health Institute out of South Africa, the International Center for Research on Women, both in Washington, D.C., and also the Asia Regional Office of ICRW, Karnataka Health Promotion Trust in India, and the National Institutes of Medical Research in Tanzania. Our aims are to elevate the importance of structural drivers in HIV uh, in HIV and development discourse and explore how structural drivers intersect to influence environments of risk for HIV. And now I would like to um, uh, introduce our, our speaker for today. I'm, I'm very delighted to introduce Professor Daniel Jordan Smith, who as a doctoral student served as a committee member on my undergraduate thesis, but he is now professor and chair of the anthropology department at Brown University. He also works closely with and was the associate director of the Population Studies and Training Center at Brown. His research focuses on understanding the intersection of social change and social reproduction, particularly in population, processes, and health-related behavior. And for over a decade and a half, uh, much of his work has focused on the social context and consequences of HIV, specifically in Nigeria. He led the Nigeria component of an NIH-supported five-country comparative ethnographic study that many of you are probably familiar with, Love, Marriage, and HIV. Um, and today he will be describing some of the central arguments made in the latest of his growing collection of award-winning books entitled AIDS Doesn't Show Its Face, Inequality, Morality, and Social Change in Nigeria, which won the uh, 2015 Elliott P. Skinner Award from the Association for Africanist Anthropology. I think his work is especially important for those of us who are committed to addressing structural drivers of HIV to consider. He's going to argue that the relationship between structural inequalities and HIV is interpreted in moral terms, which carries uh, further implications for the epidemic that, that we should all be thinking about. Um, we will need to invite him back for another webinar uh, for his next-to-be award-winning book, I'm sure, which is going to address men, money, and masculinities, which I'm looking very forward to. Um, finally, he has a BA in sociology from Harvard, an MPH from Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, and his PhD from anthropology, uh, in anthropology from Emory University. Dan Smith, welcome very much. Thank you so much for, for, um, presenting for us today. Thank you, Kirsten, and, uh, thank you everyone at Drive for, for having me, uh, this morning for this webinar. So what I want to do is, uh, as Kirsten kind of foreshadowed is, talk about the relationship between morality and structural drivers of HIV, and I want to do that based on uh, my research in Nigeria. I think all of us who, who work on, on HIV and in public health um, have spent a long time trying to get um, governments and donors and, and so on to pay more attention to the structural drivers of the epidemic. Um, and partly I think that's, that was a result of the way in which um, – individual people and the things they had in their heads and uh, tradition and culture and, and so on have been have been blamed uh, in a kind of misguided way for uh, the proliferation of HIV around the world, whether it was sexual orientation in the United States or notions about traditional African sexual cultures on the subcontinent or, or what have you. Certain kinds of perspectives on the role of culture and morality in HIV, in driving the HIV epidemic have been, have been detrimental to, to good public health, good understanding, good public health work, good policies, and, and good programs. Uh, but what I want to argue today is that, is that we, we need to be careful about throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and that as we move toward a more structural understanding and structural uh, pro policies and programs to address the epidemic, we need to continue to pay attention to morality, but perhaps in a somewhat kind of different way than we have in the past. Um, so that's what I'm going to focus on in the, in the, in the, in the webinar. Um, and I'm going to do it kind of drawing on this book that, that Kirsten mentioned that I published in 2014 called AIDS Doesn't Show Its Face. And I just want to say a couple words about the kind of larger project and then really zero in on this relationship between morality and inequality in the AIDS epidemic focusing on Nigeria. <clears throat> 
Um, for the larger project, I was I was I was motivated by what seemed to me a real um, problem in the in the relationship between research and and journalism and, and, and media understandings of the AIDS epidemic and our understandings of Africa. And essentially, what what bothered me was that it seemed like um, well, the AIDS epidemic has generated a huge amount of publicity, uh, journalism, and particularly for me as a scholar, uh, research money and, and, and scholarship about AIDS, about AIDS in Africa, about medical anthropology more generally. It, it, over the two decades, it, it was looking to me like, you know, kind of Africa was just a venue to understand AIDS and, and uh, really – um, a lot of the research that, that has been conducted in, in sub-Saharan Africa looked like it, it wasn't actually concerned with understanding Africa. Africa was just kind of a backdrop to understand the AIDS epidemic. And so what I wanted to do in the book was kind of reverse this usual optics, where, where ideas about Africa, about aberrant sexuality, about patriarchy, about traditions, about culture, were used to explain AIDS. And I wanted to kind of flip that on its head and think about the ways in which um, – Africans, and in my case, Nigerians' understandings of and responses to the epidemic were a window onto society. And so what I ended up doing was writing this book that was a lot about the relationship between morality and inequality as it manifests itself in Nigerians' understandings and responses to AIDS, but as it sort of stands for a larger relationship between morality and inequality in how Nigerians are experiencing social change and, and understanding things about their society that I think we ignore at our peril. Um, so, so I'm not going to talk about the larger book project per se in this webinar. I'm really going to focus in on the ways in which I'm trying to argue that morality still remains incredibly important in understanding the AIDS epidemic and how we might respond to it. And, and essentially, one, one way to think about what I'm going to argue is that when we think about structural drivers for the epidemic, we tend to think of structure in very material terms. We think of it as economics. We think of it as political economy. We think of it as, uh, you know, access to transportation, access to health services, and so on. And, indeed, all those things are structural. But what I want to try to convince you of this morning is that morality is also structural. Culture is also structural. And that there's a relationship between the continued power of material structural inequalities and the moral understandings that, that gird them or protect them or obscure them. So um, Nigeria, I don't need to say probably too much to most of you. You're, you're well aware that it's, a, it's an important country for the epidemic. The slide's a little out of date. I think the estimates are that Nigeria has like 180 million people now. Uh, the, the, the prevalence is kind of a moving target, but it's always been estimated somewhere between the high 2% and the low 5%. Uh, the data isn't all that great, but whatever 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 it is, Somewhere between 3 and 4% probably, it produces an awful lot of people living with HIV and a lot of deaths. So, um, so AIDS is a really important problem in Nigeria. Most estimates are that it's either the second or the third largest absolute number of people living with AIDS in the world after only South Africa and maybe after India. Um, when I first started the book, my, my original title was going to be The Imagined Epidemic. When I said in the manuscript for review, I called it The Imagined Epidemic. And what I was trying to argue – with that title was that the imagined epidemic, and what I meant by the imagined epidemic was the, the sort of stories that people told about AIDS, the moral understandings people had about AIDS, the, the social and cultural responses to the, AIDS, to, to the AIDS epidemic have been in many ways just as consequential as the quote-unquote real epidemic. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, there was I, I thought it would make a nice title for the book because it played on a lot of the um, messages that were being conveyed about AIDS, not only in Nigeria, but across a lot of contexts, which is which was that AIDS is real. So there, for a long time, even in places like Nigeria with a relatively large epidemic, for a long time, this notion that maybe AIDS wasn't real. There was this notion among the donors and then the government and NGOs and so on that they had to convince people that AIDS was, was real. Well, I ended up not, not using that title for the book because the reviewers who reviewed the book one of whom I later found out worked in South Africa, where there's a much larger real epidemic, hated the notion that uh, that the book should be called The Imagined Epidemic because they were repelled by the idea that someone would argue that an imagined epidemic was as consequential as a real epidemic. So I, I like all the title, but, but many of the arguments that I wanted to make uh, remained in the book. And what I'm going to try to do in the remaining minutes of, of, of what I'm going to say 
is give you evidence from two projects about that I research project that I conducted in Nigeria over the last dozen years or so uh, to, to to make this argument that um, that uh, morality remains central to how we need to understand people's behavioral responses to HIV uh, in Nigeria, but I think this is something that applies you know much more widely across sub-Saharan Africa and arguably around the world. And one project focused on young rural to urban migrants and the other project focused on understanding the risk of marital transmission of HIV. So the project on young migrants um, I under, was undertaken in the very early 2000s, focusing on rural to urban migrants in two Nigerian cities, Aba, which is in the southeast, and Kano, which is the biggest city in northern Nigeria. And um, I'm not going to say too much about the research, but just uh, the findings in the research, but just to emphasize that even back in 2001 when we started this project, young people in Nigeria knew a lot about HIV. 99% we did, a, we did in addition to the sort of ethnographic participant observation and intensive interview, and we did surveys of about 800 young people, half in Aba, half in Kano, just to get a sense of the kind of background uh, knowledge, attitudes, and practices kind of stuff. And 99% um, of the, the, these are young people between the ages of 15 and 24 had heard of, of HIV. 87% knew that it had been trans, that it could be transmitted through, through sexual intercourse. 96% knew what a condom was. Um, but what was more interesting to me, that wasn't, that wasn't so surprising. I mean, by that time there had been a lot of um, publicity about AIDS in Nigeria. What was more interesting to me was that what was the seeming disconnect between people's perception of AIDS as a problem. 85% of people said it was, uh, respondents said it was big or very big. Uh, so, you know, almost everybody. Um, and then two-thirds of respondents said their own risk was was uh, little or not. And so that struck me as kind of an interesting disconnect because the ethnographic interview presented a much more dramatic picture of that contrast with people really talking about AIDS in kind of cataclysmic, religious terms, you know, punishment for social immorality, Nigeria was becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah, all these kinds of things. And yet you talk to young people about their own risk, and they say, oh, no, no, no I'm, I'm, I'm not at risk at all. So I was interested in understanding how people could kind of maintain that um, seemingly contradictory understanding. If it's such a huge problem, why am I at little or no risk? And essentially the explanation uh, for that disconnect came down to really trying to focus in on and understand the ways in which people's responses to the epidemic depended on their moral understandings of AIDS as a as a as a disease and as a social problem. So um uh and and, and a lot of that hinged on on the, the the kind of contradictory and dual pressures that young people face with regard to their sexuality. On the one hand, lots of um social and structural drivers kind of putting pressure on young people to get involved in premarital sex, uh, economic needs being part of it, but also peer pressure to be young and modern and urban and so on. But taking place in a society where there continues to be strong moralities that portray premarital sex negatively, um, that premarital sex uh, is part of a kind of larger uh, set of social problems associated with modernization, with urbanization, and so on. So young people face these very contradictory dynamics around their premarital sexual behavior, um, exacerbated by the AIDS epidemic, which, again, is kind of portrayed in Nigeria, even up to now, as a kind of consequence of kind of massive social immorality, right? And so what young people did, what we found in this in this project that young people did was they, they – um, they essentially tried to construct their, for themselves and for their partners and for their kind of public that they're performing for, uh, construct their sexual relationships in moral terms. And so people became very convinced that, um, that, that the way to prevent AIDS through sexual transmission was to make sure about the kind of moral character of your partners. And I'm just going to show you a few images now that kind of, that, 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 that suggest that the, um, programmatic response, including donor-supported programmatic response to the AIDS epidemic, fed into this kind of moralization of the epidemic and the idea that, you know, that, that the, the disease was a moral problem um, and that the solution was moral behavior. Now, a lot of those messages, like this one, zip up, sex is worth waiting for, or this one, abstain from early sex, uh, had their intention uh, as kind of 
getting young people to abstain until they were married. But the reality is that didn't happen, not surprisingly. And so what ended up happening is that people would construct their relationships with their partners in moral terms. So if you can't abstain, at least you can find a kind of a moral partner. Uh, this, this, this image here, uh, sponsored by the Ministry of Health and Emo States in southeastern Nigeria, which is one of the places where I work, is kind of, for me, the sort of starkest example of the ways in which government and donor-supported programs uh, promote this association between AIDS and immoral conduct. So promote good conduct, not good conduct. In other words, condoms, uh, that was one of the kind of salient features of this whole play of forces between the epidemic and morality and the drivers of HIV. Condoms themselves became kind of symbols of um, symbols of sin, symbols of the AIDS epidemic, and so lots of young people talked about condoms as things that they wouldn't use because uh, they would they were things that um, that were associated with AIDS. And so lots of the quotes that we have from from young people that we talked to, um, you know, suggested that condom use was for casual sex, it was for first encounters, but when you really knew the character of your partner, you didn't need to you didn't need to use the condom. So there's there's this quote from a young migrant in Kano. Another young guy in, in uh, talking about uh, what he might think of his girlfriend if she kept a condom, that she would appear somehow professional. Uh, women themselves, them, young women themselves, also kind of very much participating in this kind of moral economy of, of uh, morality, uh, of, of love, of trust that um, affected how people would decide when they would use condoms and, and whether they would protect themselves from or what would protect them from, from HIV. So, uh, I would argue that this is not just a Nigerian phenomenon, that, um, you know, there's probably an association between length of relationship and trust in relationships and condom use in every society, and that, that probably, you know, precedes the AIDS epidemic, but, but has been dramatically exacerbated by uh, people's moral associations of character uh, as a kind of central feature of whether someone's at risk of, of giving you HIV or not. So, um, so the, the sort of second point on this slide here is that the, the, the main the main thing I want to try to get across uh, from a very brief sketch of this research project that we conducted in the early 2000s, which is that um, these moral logics that underlie young people's sexual behavior are in many ways responses to an implicit critiques of a collective sense that many social changes associated with urbanization and modernization are threatening to value forms of sociality. So that's, that, that connects to the kind of larger theme of the, of the, of the book itself. Uh, but but, but it, it's what I want to convey is, is that, you know, there are all these structural changes happening in places like Nigeria with urbanization, with, you know, the penetration of capitalism, with the growth of inequality, with, you know, all the, all the challenges that people face when they migrate to cities, when they try to seek employment, when they try to make money in a, in a, in a very difficult set of circumstances. And um, those are the things we tend to think of as, you know, the structural drivers of the HIV epidemic. And what I'm trying to argue is that that's all true, but we need to pay attention to the way in which those things kind of weave their way through people's minds, weave their way through collective morality. We, and, and that, and that, and that it, it ultimately, in many ways, the structural drivers of the epidemic manifest themselves in response to people's moral understandings of those structural realities and contradictions that they face in the world. Um, so, you know, what do you do about this? Well, I'm not going to spend a lot. We can talk about that maybe more in the, the, the questions and the discussions. But, you know, somehow uh, things went wrong in the relationship in, between morality and common use in particular in, in Nigeria and I think a lot of places around the world. And, um what needs to be done is to, to reconfigure condoms as, as moral social practice. And that's certainly not the case, at least among many young people uh, in contemporary Nigeria, and I would argue in lots of places around the world. The second project, Love, Marriage, and HIV, as I said, was focusing on um, marriage and the marital risk of marital transmission. We embarked on this project of kind of five-country comparative ethnographic study, something anthropologists don't often do. Um, in response to kind of growing awareness in the late 90s that, um, and early 2000s that for many women around the world, the biggest risk of contracting HIV was having sex with their own husband, which was obviously extremely problematic given that then, more or less as now, the, the primary uh, 
prevention strategy for HIV in Africa and in the, around the world was ABC, abstinence, be faithful, and condom use. And, of course, for a woman who might be abstinent until marriage and faithful to her husband and obviously isn't using condoms because people get married in, in lots of places around the world, primarily because they want to make families, uh, women could live up to the ABC uh, approach as closely as they possibly could, and they'd still be at risk of contracting HIV from their uh, from their cheating husbands. We were interested in particular in the relationship between extramarital sex and this sort of rise of modern marriage, the kind of globalization of ideas of love as a relationship ideal. And that was a, a sort of important feature of the project. But what I want to focus on in the in the few remaining minutes as I talk about this particular project was the way in which for men, for their extramarital partners and for their wives, morality and, and, and the sort of preoccupation with being a moral person in all aspects of one's life, but certainly in one's sexual life, uh, played an important part in understanding the actual dynamics of extramarital sex. So, so in some ways, a kind of um, counterintuitive uh, notion in the sense that, you know, in most societies around the world, extramarital sex is considered immoral. And that's um, to some extent true in, in, in Nigeria as well. And yet, when you look at the, 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 the understandings that individuals have of their behavior, including men who are cheating on their wives, including the girlfriends who are partners of men who are cheating on their wives, and including the responses of wives who know, suspect, or know that their husbands are cheating, uh, their considerations tacit or explicit about what they're going to do are, are very much uh, contingent on, on moral understandings of the world. So just a few images that were associated with this project. In southeastern Nigeria, where I work, uh, I always like to joke that uh, you know, there's just this huge proliferation of, of hotels in all the in all the cities of the southeast. And, and as far as I could tell, they had kind of two major sources of business. And one was uh, married men taking their girlfriends there uh, for for their trips, and the other, uh, ironically, uh, NGO training uh, workshops. Uh, this is just a, a slide of a, of a brothel, uh, a place that most men wouldn't want to go for uh, to meet a girlfriend. I just put it in there for the laugh because of the the name of the brothel, Climax Standard Hotel. What a what a appropriate name, a good name for a brothel. Okay, so um, uh, love, sex, and marriage are 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 all in the air in Nigeria. There's there's you know, there's, there's lots of media stuff. There's, there's I put this in there because uh, I, I tried to collect as well as meeting all these uh, couple, married couples and talking to men uh, about their their married lives, their their sexual relationships, and so on. Having my female research assistants talk to women, I tried to collect all this popular cultural material about um, about love and marriage and and sex and HIV and so on. And in fact, those magazines would come out sort of every Thursday afternoon in Nigeria. They sell magazines kind of on the on the ground, on street corners, and uh, these Nigerian uh, romance magazines are con- kind of considered women's magazines. At least that's how men talk about them. So every Thursday, I would go out and uh, purchase all five of them, uh, you know, for two, three months at a time. And after a few weeks of it, I could just see the the newspaper vendor just kind of looking at me like, why is this guy buying all these girls' magazines? And uh, so I felt compelled to kind of explain to him that I was doing research, and he kind of looked at me skeptically like, yeah, sure, buddy. Uh, all right, so same same kind of story around extramar- around the sort of AIDS public health iconography uh, regarding extramarital sex as 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 with premarital sex. Um, what I mean by that is that that very moralistic kinds of messages. I mean, if you look at avoid AIDS, no extramarital sex. If you look closely at this. This uh, poster, which is funded by DFID, uh, DFID Nigeria. Um, so, so look at the the my partner, the man saying my partner is okay. Look at his look at the the extramarital sex he's supposed to avoid. That's clearly a prostitute, dressed like a prostitute, and yet most married men are not interested in having sex with prostitutes. They're interested in having sex with sophisticated young university girls. And so, this image paints, you know, immoral sex in this. Uh, extramarital sex in this immoral way that most men can avoid because, of course, they're not having sex with a prostitute. They're having sex with a young woman who they who they have a very more complicated relationship with, with gift-giving instead of paying money, with actual emotional attachment instead of commercial sex and so on. And then even more kind of inappropriate, you know, the idea that the woman, if she's going to have sex, is going to have sex with some small boy, a schoolboy, right? Uh, again, these images... You know, meant to kind of convey a message of 
about extramarital sex as a, as a risk for contracting HIV, but end up kind of having counterproductive effects by enabling people to more easily reconstruct their own choices in moral terms that look nothing like the overly simplistic moralism that characterizes these types of public health methods. Um, so, so just to, to, to wrap up about the, this particular project, um, for each of the, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, for each of the, the actors, for men vis-a-vis their wives, uh, you know, cheating men in Nigeria, and as I think we've found the four other countries as well, um, can really, you know, present to themselves, to their peers, to the world, this notion that they're still moral actors even as they're cheating because in so many places around the world, the main thing a man is supposed to do as a husband is provide for the family, provide for the wife, provide for his children. And if he's doing that and he keeps his infidelity discreet, then essentially he can be seen as behaving morally. And it, and it sort of undermines any moral message about uh, extramarital sex uh, as putting one at risk for HIV because men are constructing their extramarital sex in moral terms. Um, same thing with their girlfriends. I mean, you know, like as, a, as I sort of suggested in that, in discussing that poster, um, Men made relationships moral with their girlfriend, their extramarital girlfriends, by doing things like providing gifts, by acting like a good patron, by caring. Um, and, and all of those things came along with reduced likelihood of conduct. The more moral, I mean, that's a huge part of my message here, the more moral a relationship is perceived, the less likely people are to use condoms. And, 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 and the moralities that people are constructing around their sexual relationships are in direct relationship to the anxieties they feel about AIDS at, vis-a-vis their larger understandings of social changes happening in society that people see as the result of a kind of collective immorality. And even for wives, particularly, uh, this is one of the more interesting findings of the project, the, the kind of the more modern the marriage was, the more likely that a couple was to describe their marriage as a love marriage, the less likely women would be to openly air accusations of infidelity against their husband because it could boomerang against, against, back against them and undermine the moral leverage that they have in the marriage. In a love marriage, a woman's moral leverage is around the love in the marriage, right? And, and in a society like southeastern Nigeria, where I work, where divorce is still extremely uncommon, where uh, women can be kind of blamed for bad things that, that men do, the more likely the, the more likely it was that a woman was in a love marriage, the more likely it was that she would not say anything about her husband's infidelity. Okay, so um, so that's kind of the the, the story that I, I, I want to portray. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll say is that um, you know it's it's really important. I didn't I didn't dwell on it in this in this talk too much, but it's really important to sort of think about the way in which these moral responses to the epidemic, these moral understandings of, of social change, of structural inequalities are, are highly gendered. And that, that, that's partly why I'm moved from this book about AIDS and social change, uh, the intersection of inequality and morality, to the new project, which is really focused on masculinity, uh, money, and intimacy, and looking at the ways in which, um, in, in which for men there's this very complicated relationship between uh, the ways they're supposed to do intimacy not just in their relationships with women, but across the whole range of social relationships and the expectations that, that they face with regard to having and spending money and so on. So uh, finally, um, you know, I think, you know, ultimately the message here is that, um, as I said at the very beginning, we, we, we need to not abandon a lens that considers morality uh, in understanding and, and designing public health programs to address the AIDS epidemic, but we need to really reconfigure how we do that. And so, you know, to kind of re-sketch the problem, um, you know, in the past, I think, and still in many ways it happens, um, the association between AIDS and and morality has been a kind of uh, simplistic blame the victim, blame the culture, blame tradition, blame the Africans for their problem kind of model. Uh, and, And the move toward more structural understandings is, is, is great. It's, it's, it's important. It's pushing us in the right direction. But, you know, as I said in the beginning, I think we ignore morality at our peril because ultimately um, when people act in the world, uh, 
they don't they don't go around saying to themselves, "Oh, look at the structural world. I'm going to respond in a structural way." Right? They go they they go around the world and say, "Look at the world and say, oh, look at the world. The world is full of these um, social expectations, these moral imperatives, these moral conundrums that I'm going to behave in a way that makes me look like makes me a good moral person." And that's a lot of what people are doing in response to the AIDS epidemic and. Um, and so I think it's really important for us to continue to pay attention to uh, morality uh, and, and to, and, you know, frankly, to think of morality as a part of social structure. Thank you very much. Um, terrific. Thank you so much. One question that came in already from Catherine Dodds. Do you have much sense about the extent to which your findings on these issues extend beyond Nigeria to other sub-Saharan African countries and also among members of the global African diaspora? This resonates strongly in my work with African migrants in the UK, which is why I asked. Well, I can only speculate in the sense that I haven't done uh, – I mean, it's a good question, I, and I, I mentioned – several times along the way in the uh, in the presentation that I believe uh, that these findings do extend more widely. Um, I mean, my only other kind of extensive on-the-ground experience is in Sierra Leone, where I was a Peace Corps volunteer for three and a half years, but that was really before the AIDS epidemic. So I haven't myself done, um, you know, this kind of research anywhere else but in but in Nigeria. Uh, having said that, though, I mean, the Love, Marriage, and HIV Project was a five-country study. Um, you know, the, the, we, the other countries were Uganda, uh, Vietnam, Papua New Guinea, and Mexico. Um, and we weren't, in that project, directly focusing on the relationship between morality and inequality. But, 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 but the findings that I have drawn on from that project to contribute to this argument about the relationship between morality and inequality and between people's moral understandings of the ep epidemic and their behavioral responses. Uh, the, the, the material I've drawn on from that project, from, from that project in Nigeria uh, is very similar to things that we found in the, that my co-collaborators uh, found in, in, in other countries. So, um, I, you know, everything I know about human beings and, and about human society and, and the relationship between culture and social structure and, 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 and lots of, kind of theory and anthropology and so on would suggest that this is not kind of a one-off thing in Nigeria. I think it's, it's, it's um, something that probably does apply in lots more settings. Now, you know, one caveat to that, I mean, I, I, going back to the kind of reaction to the, uh, to the scholar who reviewed my book manuscript who worked in South Africa, I mean, the relative importance of people's imagined understandings of a disease versus the reality of the disease, is, it, that's going to be different in different places around the world. I mean, you know, it would be – people have a much more direct experience with with HIV, with people being HIV positive and living with AIDS in countries in southern and central and East Africa than in West Africa. I mean, Nigeria has one of the highest prevalences in West Africa, and it's still only around 3%. So – so the dynamics are going to be a bit different in different places. I don't want to say that what's happening in Nigeria is going to be happening exactly in other places, but I'm very convinced that um, that that morality and people's moral understandings of their own behavior and 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 the moral ways in which people navigate sexual relationships um, is going to be hugely important in any place that one has an HIV epidemic. I'm I'm, I'm pretty convinced of that. Great, thank you. All right, I, uh, we also have a question here from um, Andrew Gibbs, who asks, I wonder whether you could reflect on the extent to which the moral injunctions in Nigeria were supported or driven by U.S. foreign funding beyond the direct funding of posters, campaigns, et cetera, as well as they were by social change in Nigeria. Yeah, I'd be delighted to comment on that. I mean, so, I mean, one of the things we did at the end of the Love, Marriage, and HIV project is we came back and we tried our best uh, to, to sort of translate our, our anthropological research findings into public health policy and program messages that would be digestible by policymakers in the United States. And we did this project kind of right in the middle of the Bush administration when there was uh, 
PEPFAR was started and there were all the um, the restrictions on American funding tied to, you know, restrictions on abortion, but also earmarking certain amounts of PEPFAR funding for abstinence and be faithful messages, not including condoms and so on. So we were, you know, as, as kind of in some ways members of the public health left, we were very um, concerned about the, the consequences of the of Western, particularly American at that time, uh, moral messages about the epidemic. Having said that, I became convinced through my work in Nigeria that the the propensity of the public health left in the United States, at least, to blame the Bush administration and PEPFAR for the moralization of AIDS in Africa, or at least in Nigeria, was wrongheaded. Not that it didn't feed into it, not that there was, I think there was a kind of elective affinity between um, moralizing American policies and moral understandings of the epidemic in Nigeria, but I don't think they caused it. So um, I've long thought that, you know, the the sort of picture of AIDS in Africa, the kind of stereotyped picture that, that AIDS is a consequence of liberal, licentious, promiscuous sexual moralities in Africa is exactly wrong and exactly backwards. And so I think this kind of conservative response to, to HIV in Nigeria, and I would suspect in other places in Africa, is very much an indigenous response, if you will. I mean, indigenous not in some narrow sense, but indigenous in the sense that it's a Nigerian response. I mean, Nigerians were predisposed. Even without that far, they would have thought of AIDS in these in these kinds of moral terms. PEPFAR and its kind of policies fed into it. But um, my experience on the ground in, in Nigeria is that, it, that that in many ways it's a very conservative sexual culture, and that the contradictions that young people see, face and that others face is precisely an outcome of the collision between this kind of conservative sexual culture and lots of the structural drivers of modern sexuality, migration to the city, modern education, uh, economic needs, and so on. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I think Lori Heisey would like to unmute herself and ask a question. Let's go ahead, Lori. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Great. Oh, I have so many different thoughts running through my head. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just a couple of things. I worked in the same era um, working on on very similar kinds of of issues uh, in the context of of bringing attention to the need for uh, women controlled methods of HIV prevention like microbicides or rings or things that women could use. Um, because condoms, I mean, it, I think the story that you lay out here is, is almost universal. I mean, we we did you know, global reviews um, in the you know 1990s and and into the early 2000s, and and it what you saw is that with the exception of Japan, and we could talk about why Japan, but with the exception of Japan, there was no place where we were able through programming to successfully help people use condoms within emotionally important relationships, which gets to your idea of intimacy. Um, and it's interesting because I would have framed or uh, I would have started with the notion of trust and intimacy and seen the moralizing as a social or structural overlay. I mean, in the sense that I think what drives people to not use condoms in these settings is the desire for for trust and, and, and intimacy, and that the moralizing is much more a function of, as you said, the kind of, uh, of conservative culture and religious overtones and things that then people place themselves within. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that you saw that even, you know, people say all over the world that condoms are a thing of the street because they've been associated with sex work, um, or at least mm -hmm. back then they were associated with sex work. Um, and we spoke a lot about the need to position new products, should they become available, as a thing of the home. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
and 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 actually be positioned not even ter- in terms of who they be would be used by, but for a certain type of relationship. This is what you use with someone that you love or you care about, and a condom is what you use for casual or new or paying clients because that's how people use things. And I think we're at a really interesting moment in time right now because now we do have, after CROI, I mean, there's a few new products and approaches that are being deployed internationally. And the first groups that people are introducing them to, or not the exclusively, but is sex workers. And we always argued against that because mm. we thought it's very important that it be introduced for a type of relationship and not become tainted before it became acceptable um, because it would feed into that moral distancing. Mm-hmm. So I just wondered if you had, I mean, I, that was just a, a comment. And, um, you know, I, I think the work is, is actually quite reflective of what you would have seen in many, many parts of the world, or you did see it, obviously, you were in five countries. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 you know, I think I kind of agree with and find supportive of what I'm saying, everything that you just said. I mean, I guess the only thing I would, you know, sort of um, respond to is is the the part about, I mean, I have no problem, I think, you know, kind of focusing on trust and intimacy and recognizing that part of what people are doing when they're um, constructing a sexual relationship is, is looking for trust and intimacy and, and and that the, the, the sort of um, desire not to use condoms goes along with increasing trust and intimacy. And, and I think that, you know, that, that that's probably something that would happen even without the huge moral overlay that AIDS exacerbated. Having said that, though, I, I guess I'm, I'm still, you know, I still think, I, I guess I see the, the, the sort of moral concerns as more than just an overlay. In other words, I guess I'm, I'm suggesting that, um, you know, that that there are lots of huge changes happening in places like Nigeria um, and that those huge changes, you know, I mean, there's not enough time to go into them all, but, but those political and economic changes, urbanization, migration, rising levels of education, rising inequality, penetration of capitalist markets, all that kind of stuff. That that that's all taking place in a world where people are are still you know moral actors right and mm-hmm. so and so that that's what I'm kind of trying to push on here is that is that is that as we even as we need to pay attention to these structural underpinnings of of why people do what we do we need to not lose sight of the fact that in people's minds and in the sort of shared intersubjective world in which people live in. Um, you know, they're usually thinking first about the kind of moral dimensions and consequences of their behavior, um, and that all the structural stuff, stuff is always kind of filtered through that. And, and in fact, I, I just find it useful to think of morality as a, as and culture, the sort of moral dimensions of culture, as part of the social structure rather than some sort of superstructural thing or something that's just a kind of sideline. But but I agree with I mean. Everything you said, and it strikes me as would be really important is introducing these female controlled methods to have them seep into society and culture uh, not as things that are meant for commercial sex workers but are meant for people in caring intimate trusting relationships right yeah I, I I look forward to reading some of your stuff because I do agree that it you know I, I think the idea it's not one that i I had um, of you know, con- seeing the structure of moral culture and everything as, as a driver itself, and then people are navigating themselves and their behaviors within that in order to achieve the same sense, you know, the, achieve the same sense of, of concordance with the identity, you know, given all this other stuff. And you've also got, I'm sure, uh, all of the anxiety that is happening with these big other structural shifts and that frequently women's bodies and, and women become the sort of cultural, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I mean, you, you often see the, the imposition of greater conservative traditionalism in the face of massive kind of 
of dislocations like that focused on things like yeah. we, uh, related to women's behavior. And yes, yes. I mean, I think there's just no question that that women's women's sexuality and women's sexual behavior, women's bodies. Um, you know, are, are, are in the era of AIDS, but, but have long been the sort of, um, you know, sort of gendered physical location of lots of, uh, social work around society's anxiety with regard to morality, right? I mean, right. That, there, and, and that's, that's just, again, I think one of these things that's kind of a, almost a cross-cultural universal. But, but the, but, you know, and, and is, and is, you know, exacerbated in places like Nigeria about by the very social changes that are pushing back against that, right? So, in other words, you know, the fact that women are getting education more and more, that they're moving to cities, that they're, you know, having choice about who they marry. I mean, all these things are, are signs of social change that, you know, one could argue is good for women, but they have, and I think is good for women, but, but they have a sort of backlash dimension to them too, which, which you know, further exacerbates the, the sort of moral um, focus on, on, on women and their and, and their behavior, which you know, which women then have to respond to, right? I mean so so I mean when we interviewed the married women in these couples where where men in their interviews would openly say to me as a fellow man that they cheated on their wives and that, and that in fact their wife had caught them and she'd not cooked for them for two weeks or something like that in, in response. My female research assistants would interview the women, and the women would say, oh, no, my husband never cheated, right? I mean, you know, in some sense kind of complicit in protecting him because her own moral uh, kind of um, stakes were invested in having a faithful husband, right? So that was what I was talking about the way at the end of the, to- at the, end of the presentation about the relationship between love marriage and, and the sort of irony, you would think that love marriage is kind of a, a, a sort of um, symbol of, of, of changing society in, in ways that might be good for women, but it, it doesn't always work out exactly as, as one might imagine. I see a, an interesting question here um, from Praise, who, who's – there's two questions, but the one that I'm going to read out here is, do you have a problem speaking to people about HIV openly in Nigeria, especially in relation to men who have sex with men, as it seems to be morally – construed and illegal and and it seems from my personal experience as a Nigerian that that the most comfortable to speak are those of higher income brackets, thus possibly skewing the generalizability of findings. So well for these projects that I work, the the, the migrants project and the Love Marriage and HIV project, I mean, we talk to people across a host of, of, of um social spectrum. So feel pretty convinced that what I'm saying is not just the perspective of, of, of the elites and of, 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 of the upper class. Having said that, though, the question about men who have sex with men, I mean, um, not many people in, in my experience in Nigeria will talk openly about about that. Um, Nigerians tend to deny, most Nigerians will deny that there is such a thing in Nigeria, or if they talk about it, they'll talk about it as something that some other cultural group does. So in southeastern where in Nigeria where I work, they'll say, oh, northerners do that, but we Igbos, we don't we don't do that. Um and my perspective on 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 the kind of cultural response to homosexuality in Nigeria, which has been extremely hostile. I mean Nigeria is one of these countries that has flirted with passing laws to you know, to, to execute people caught with caught caught you know, engaging in homosexual men caught engaged in homosexual acts. My perspective on that is, is, you know, feeds off of this larger argument that I've been making, making, which is that I think that the, the the extreme homophobia that one sees in many African countries needs to be understood in the context of of anxieties and discontents that people have about the perception of what Westernization is doing to their societies. I mean, westernization comes to stand in people's minds for, you know, the consequences of the penetration of capitalism, for rising inequality, for uh, changes in, in, in gender dynamics and so on. And so um, homosexuality is, is in some ways kind of seen by people as kind of the quintessential destruction of traditional African morality in the face of westernization, right? And so there's lots of scholarship to suggest that, that homosexual practice has existed long in Africa and it's been relatively tolerated. 
um, mostly tolerated because people continue to live up to the expectations of, of um, you know, heteronormative social reproduction. So most men who have sex with men in Africa marry and have children, marry women and have children. And, and it's sort of accepted, not accepted, but it's kind of tolerated that people could engage in homosexual practices as long as they live up to the sort of normative gendered expectations. The hyper concern with homosexuality in contemporary Africa, I think, can't be explained uh, accurately unless one sees it as kind of symbolic in people's minds of forms of social change about which they are extremely anxious. And, and, and in this sense, ironically, a focus more on men's bodies than on women's. I mean, there's not, I mean, there's some, you, know, you see it in South Africa and so on, there's some concern about lesbianism, but it's much more, um, you know, men having sex with men that is the, the target of this extreme moralism and anxiety in, in, African, in African context. And again, I think it's directly related to what people feel are these larger threats that social change, often kind of too, too simplistically labeled as westernization, um, is having on, on everyday social life. Great. I think, Catherine Dodds, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hi. Um, I just wanted to follow on with that point as well, because in some work uh, that I think the Kaleidoscope Trust has done uh, in Uganda and also in Nigeria relates to that last point you were talking about, Dan, which is also about the rise of um, American evangelical churches seeing uh, a lot of African countries as a new market, so there have been a, there's been a, a very concerted effort for American preachers to um, expand their markets in America in African countries, um, and they can play on all those things that you just mentioned, Dan, about um, changing norms, urbanization, the loss of a forgotten past, you know, whatever those imaginings are, and really fostering this sense of sexual um, uh, morality in relation to premarital sex, in relation to, um, you know, uh, men who have sex with men and women who have sex with women. And so to me, I think that's another component of the structural forces at play that are sure. preying on, um, you know, economic and, and cultural change that are then building and reinforcing this moral shift that you're talking about. I agree. I mean, I, I guess the only thing I would say in response to that is to kind of go back to the the, the what I think is a slight danger of, of um, you know, putting too much causal weight on the external intervention. So, you know, I was talking earlier about the Bush administration and that far and the yeah. American earmarks and things like, you know, restrictions on, on how money could be spent and so on. All of which I think are important, and I, and I think what you're saying about the kind of American evangelicals uh, seizing on what they see as an opportunity in, in Africa is true. I just think that it's important not to, as some, as some, I'm not saying you're doing this, but I think as some on the public health left might do, is just kind of blame this blame on, yeah, I agree. on West on, on Western intervention, and not to see that it's a kind of elective affinity, right? That 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 the, that the, the evangelicals, just like the Bush administration capitalize on something that, that they didn't invent in Africa, but that they can exploit. And so yeah, yeah. my point is that, is, is that to, 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 to when you realize that they didn't invent it, that it's there, um, then, then, then one needs to take it seriously and deal with it. And so, and so I think the, you know, the, the moral conservatism that one sees in response to AIDS is indicative of a larger Seen, uh, you know, on the continent that that needs to be understood, and 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 you know, again, a lot of it I think has to do with people's anxieties and discontents with regard to a whole host of social changes, and and you know, what I've always struggled with is, you know, and I still do, is, is the question of whether this kind of moralized understandings, and I, I confront this most directly with the kind of popularity of Pentecostal Christianity, which is just sweeping the the place that I work in, in, in southeastern Nigeria. What I've always struggled with is the question of whether these moralizing understandings are, are kind of a political consciousness inhibiting thing, uh, which is kind of my knee-jerk reaction as a Western social scientist, 
or whether there's some more complicated, subtle, nuanced way of understanding it, which is what I've come to believe, which is to say that um, rather than dismissing people's moralized understandings of inequality and social change as blocking political consciousness or blocking effective political mobilization and so on, instead we need to see them as, a, as, as having a certain politics to them themselves, and we need to understand what that is and we need to be able to deal with that rather than just say, oh, when Africans think about AIDS in moral terms or when they, they think about when they moralize about homosexuality, they're just, they're just, you know, applying cultural moral understandings to things that we need to understand in some other way. And I, I think my point is with all this work that I've done, I've come to, you know, still not figured it all out, but, but come to this idea that, like, these moral understandings are in a way, including Pentecostal Christianity, are in a way a kind of political stance as well. And understanding what that is and what consequences it has, what consequences it has, I think is really important. Um, I don't know if we're going to have time for you to answer this question, Dan, but I had a, a question about um, whether or not you could just talk a little bit about how, um, from the perspective of the young woman, how um, they produced their behavior or, you know, came to view their behavior in moral, in moral terms in, 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 in your work. You know, if you could speak to the other half of the equation. Sure. So. So one of the things I, I wrote, wrote this paper um, a while back called Promiscuous Girls, Cheating Husbands and Good Wives, and I was interested in how it is that these seemingly promiscuous schoolgirls who have affairs with married men and, you know, maybe multiple relationships before they get married, how they manage to transform themselves into good wives, how they manage to, you know, escape, how they manage to kind of not be viewed morally negatively by the men and families that want to marry them. And, and, and you know, again, I, I think, you know, what's interesting about young women in Nigeria, at least in southeastern Nigeria where I, where I work, is that, you know, even as they're engaged in premarital sex, whether it's with their peers or whether it's with older married men because they can benefit from those relationships in certain kinds of ways, they have by no means, most of them, the vast majority of them, let go of the larger kind of moral life project of social reproduction. They all intend ultimately to get married and to have children, right? And so they navigate those premarital relationships, whether they're extramarital relationships or otherwise, in ways that help them preserve a kind of moral future as potential wives. And the biggest way that that happens, frankly, in southeastern Nigeria where I work is, is through migration. So um, people in southeastern Nigeria still tend to run marriage back through community of origin. So these young women can go out, they can go to secondary school in the city, they can go to university, they can work in the city. But, but when it comes time to marry, those urban worlds that they've lived in aren't so relevant in, in you know, who they're going to marry. And so the men they're going to marry tend to be from a place of origin or near place of origin, and they don't necessarily know everything about a young woman um, kind of premarital life before they marry. That said, I think there's a bit of a nod and a wink Thing going on with the men too, which is that you know, we 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 what 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 happened in the city kind of stays in the city kind of thing. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of implications there for inequality. I wonder for folks who can't migrate. But at any rate, I don't know if we have time to answer that. This has been a fantastic presentation um, and a wonderful discussion. Um, thank you so much, um, Dan, for for um, spending this last hour with us. Um, I, I, Praise had another question for you, Dan. I don't know if there's a way that she could get in touch with you to to um, uh, address that question directly, or or if you have yeah, a sure. contact for her. Um, email me. I mean, my email is Daniel underscore J underscore Smith at Brown edu. If you go to Brown Anthropology Department, you can click to, you know just click directly on my email address. I can be happy to respond by email to that to her question or anyone else's. Great. Okay. Thank you again, everybody, so much. Have a okay. wonderful evening, afternoon, morning, <laughs> depending on where you are.